Hi, this is Janu Matthew with Tudor Doctor on Chasing Dreams with Amy J. Welcome to Chasing Dreams Podcast with Amy J. Amy believes that realizing a life without regrets is achieved by taking chances, chasing your dreams, making moves, and overcoming your doubts. The Chasing Dreams Podcast will help you overcome life's obstacles, believe in your potential, and inspire you to face your fears. And now here's the woman who is passionately pursuing her dreams, Amy J. Hey, Dream Chasers, this is Amy J, and thank you so much for tuning in to episode 78 of Chasing Dreams. Today's guest is family to me. We've grown to love one another for many years, and I am so happy to get him on the show. It, we've been talking about trying to get him on. He's been busy. He tends to have a busy life between September and June, and so, you know, scheduling has been a little tight. But this year, he's venturing into a new area. And so luckily I was able to get him on. He is my cousin, Jinu Matthew. He is a founder, I guess, or owner. company owner of a franchise called Tudor Doctor in Texas, Tarrant County. And uh, since 2016 about, and he is on the show today because he's also in the past life, a principal. And so he's very big into education, which I think, you know, when you're chasing your dreams is very important. And I tend to like teachers and principals and because I think they do some honest work and something that is much needed in today's society. And so pulling him away from his tutoring duties. Hey, Janine, what's going on? Hey, Amy. Thank you for having me on the show. That is awesome. I, I think you're doing a fabulous job and looking forward to speaking with you now and uh, answering whatever questions you have that you want to pick my brain with. You know, Jenna, you have had an interesting background and you have always been interested in education. Is that true? Uh, yes, I actually first got into education when uh, I was not doing well in uh, geometry class back in high school. And my inspiration to go into teaching is my 10th grade geometry teacher. His name was Mr. Peter Router, rest his soul but a very hard teacher. And then the following year, he asked me to tutor a student that was also failing his class. And of course, when I worked hard and got my grade up to an 88, I was able to take a kid that was failing his class and bring him up to a 92. So that's when I realized teaching is what is meant for me. Now, that's an amazing increase. And for someone at that time, probably only in high school, have you always had that kind of success with helping others? Um, yes, for the most part. I think uh, a lot of the teaching jobs that I've held, I've I had the opportunity. And actually, I would even call it venture far enough to say that it was a blessing to work with some of the more difficult students. And I've had some amazing stories that will prove that I was a good teacher to a lot of these different kids. Now, it's interesting you, you say that, I mean, because you have these stories and you have these experiences. Were most of them occurring after you got your license in to teach or your, is it a license to teach or is it educate masters? What do you need to be a teacher? So basically, it's four years of education. Most people do a education for either uh, elementary education or secondary education. I did secondary education at Peabody College in Vanderbilt. And I also did my uh, bachelor's of science in mathematics. So pretty much both of them went hand in hand and it became a math secondary education degree. So even though it said bachelor's of science, I have both uh, secondary education and mathematics. And believe it or not, my minor was theater because I do believe every good teacher is a phenomenal actor. Well, you are a drama queen. It kind of works with you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So you have to get four years of education. So that kind of makes sense right up the alley. If I wanted to be a teacher here in Maryland, could I just get those four years of education? And then if I, well, now I'm in Philly, could I just transfer to Philly and have no problems getting a job? So if you go from state to state, 
One of the most interesting things is a lot of states have different rules for education licensing, licensing. And so, you know, as as easy as it would seem for you to just go from one state to another state and the state accept your licenses. Uh, when I went from New York to Texas, I actually had to um, not only transfer all, over all my credentials, but also take the licensing exams in Texas as well. So I had to pass a generalized education test as well as a content specialty test as well. So I, I had done that, but I just uh, I never taught in Texas. I've only tutored in Texas uh, when I owned my own private math tutoring company for about two years. Um, but then I ended up going back to New York and working as a school administrator in middle school and high school. And now that I'm back in Texas, I recently uh, purchased an existing uh, franchise um, in Tarrant County. Now you have, uh, during that time when you were a teacher and a principal, you had a life experience that changed your life. I, I don't know a better way to describe it. Yeah. Right. I mean, that kind of covers it. Can you talk a little bit about what happened and how that affected your moving forward in the career of teaching? So I was a teacher and uh, around the time, around 2010, I had uh, gone through my administration program. I had received a job in administration and I had moved into working on my doctorate in education. Um, I had finished my uh, one year of my pre-dissertation in uh, my educational doctorate. It was an EDD program. And uh, around that time, back in um, October 2010, I had a mysterious stroke, which left my whole left side paralyzed. It was a completely uh, surprise attack for me because I was very healthy. And uh, actually, you, you probably remember, Amy, we... Uh, ran a 5k the week prior to that so the yeah, uh, susan g Komen. that's right so you know i definitely was surprised that i had the stroke i was paralyzed and um, around that same time um since i couldn't work and i was on disability leave it was catastrophic leave my school district was phenomenal they actually allowed me to take time off a lot of people donated uh time into my sick leave so I could get the catastrophic leave and I was still being paid and uh, it was just a phenomenal experience in the sense of how people came together to help me out uh, but ultimately um, that following year at, while I was not working I ended up getting laid off because of all the budget cuts in education uh, in New York State and my wife and I we moved to uh, Texas. And that's where I pretty much started everything all over again. Now, you asked me about the experience and how it changed me. I'll tell you one thing that it did not do to me. Mm -hmm. it, did, it did not break me. And I think one of the things that I said to myself when I had the stroke and I was paralyzed was, you know, dear God, just help me get back so that I could go back to serving kids. Because that was always my dream, you know? My dream was always to work as a teacher, work as a principal, uh, move into an assistant superintendent position in a district, and then become a superintendent of schools. Now, even though that stroke altered my uh, course a little bit, I think I'm kind of living my dream right now. I'm actually working as a franchise owner. I get to do hiring. I get to do uh, family consultations. I get to do all the things that you know, even make the major decisions for the franchise in this area. So I get to do all the things that, you know, a superintendent would do, even including like marketing the franchise and just like a superintendent would uh, go and advertise for his district or her district. Um, it's the same concept. You know, I'm, I'm out there, I'm promoting what this franchise is about, what Tudor Doctor stands for what I believe in as my philosophy, and I try to live it each and every single day. And, you know, you absolutely do. And you had the stroke at, what was what were you, 28, I think? 29. 29, and such a young age, and then to have that happen, as you were recovering, were you ever doubtful that you'd be able to get back to it? I know it didn't break you, 
But did you have moments of indecision, of doubt, of, you know, wanting to give up? I think um, anyone who has gone through a difficult time, they always have a doubt uh, cre uh, creeping somewhere underneath them. But um, ultimately, I think it's my faith that carried me through. And I just, you know, I'm a strong Christian, I believe. And I believe that um, if you pray hard and work harder, um, God will deliver. So that was my Christian side of it. And I know, I don't know if you want to talk on religion, but I'm not, I'm not really going to get too much into that. But I'll mm -hmm. tell you, that it totally um, forced me to go forward. And it was, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of people who are striving to reach something that they have to always remember is it's not about the big picture all the time. It's about those small steps you take because it's those small steps that lead you to that big picture. And if you could celebrate those small successes, ultimately those small su su successes will jigsaw into the whole puzzle. Yeah. And, you know, I think everyone has their own way of dealing with things and Christianity is something that a lot of people have. You and I always share that with our Orthodox faith. And, you know, faith is something that saw you through. I mean, you ended up becoming, is it, was it associate or assistant principal again? I was an assistant principal. Um, I have had the opportunity when the principal was out of the school and stuff to run the school as well at, at the high school level and the middle school level. But it was definitely a phenomenal experience. And also eye-opening as to how much uh, our principals really do for the schools and how little they are appreciated for the hard work they do. Yeah, that's true. And and at least you had that background and ability to see behind the scenes for that. And, you know, you truly were able to kind of go full circle, except for the superintendent part in actuality. But as you said it, you're kind of using those qualities in this new franchise. Now, do you think you would have done a franchise if you hadn't gone back to school? So I, I had gone back to school. And uh, one of the things, Amy, is that, well, actually, there are two things. One is I was living apart from my wife. She was living in Texas. And uh, I was up in New York. And one of the things that I was thinking the whole time was, you know, I'm married. Why am I living so far from my wife? That was number one. Number two was... Uh, as I was going through the public education sector, one of the things I realized, and this is more personal than anything else, and I'm going to say it because I do believe in it. I do think that there is a complacency of achievement for our students nowadays in America, and I, and it bothers me as to how little we are doing to promote our and uh, enrich our children as they go forward. People are okay with uh, B's and C's. I'm not. I nope. believe that every kid has the ability to perform at very high levels and it's about how hard or how uh, well or how um, structured we can push them to those limits. Yep. And, I, and I see it all the time. And I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. I tutored a kid in Texas. I went in. His mom told me he's terrible in math. He will never increase. He had about a 30, 40 average. And for six months, I helped reshape it, the structure of his learning, went over how to study, which a lot of kids nowadays don't even know how to do, um, taught all those different pieces, put them all together. And w around the time when I left to New York to take on those administration jobs, I got a call from mom saying that the kid had a 94, 95 average. Amazing. At, so, so is it possible for kids to do achieve very high yes but but you know at tutor doctor one of the things we say is everybody has the ability to learn and it's all about finding that perfect match of an instructor to a student and customizing that learning so that the highest level of achievement could be uh, attained it's interesting that you say that and you have that story which is an awesome one because i always thought everyone wanted to strive uh, to do their very best. I mean, my parents uh, never entertained the possibility of anything lower than an A, A plus and all that. You know, you've seen the commercial, the, the jokes and the memes that people have about Asian parents. It, it felt it fit 
for my family. And so I think I ran into someone, I was in my 20s, early 20s, and one of the kids um, in our community had, you know, said that they got a B or a C and that their parents were fine with it. I was like, I'm sorry, what? Your parents are fine with a B or C? Or C? What? What? And it, it threw me because it's like he truly believed that that's all he was capable of. And I had never run into that before. I just, I didn't know that that was out there. Do you know what that's called? No. So what for that child to believe that that was all he could do was uh, in a way instilled into his mind that's all he could do, you know? And that's called self-fulfilling prophecy. Basically, for example, let's say there's a kid who's doing very poorly and you keep telling that kid that's the that's probably the best that he could do and he tried his best. Mm -hmm. You are creating a mentality that that's the far, furthest he could go. But to push them and say, you know, all right, I see that you're suffering and learning. What could I do to help you? Or what can we figure out to make your education better? Those are the things that will pull you out of that slump. Because I've seen kids who, you know, when I was a New York City teacher, I've had kids who were part of um, different gangs or uh that were involved in the wrong crowds and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. they've turned their lives around and it's, and they had terrible grades and there were people who doubted them left and right. And many of them started falling into that pattern of believing those, uh, those set parameters on them. But ultimately when there was people to push them and encourage them, that's when you see progress. And, I don't think there's enough of that happening in our public sector anymore. And one of the things, Amy, is you can look up even, um, you know, uh, with PISA, P-I-S-A, there is a study that's done every four or five years. And you'll see that in the past eight years or so, America continues to drop in terms of achievement for math, reading and science. And it, uh, math and, and it's just um, it's horrendous. And. You know, I have my personal opinions and philosophies of why that's happening. But, you know, again, that becomes very political. But that's that's a totally different story. Um, but again, I think ultimately when it comes down, when everything is said and done and all the other uh, extremes are taken out, um, it ultimately comes down to how much a child could be uh, pushed forward and enriched so that they become successful. So self fulfilling prophecy. So what is the way to fight that? The, the best way to fight that is, I think, I believe it's support. I think it's uh, people telling someone that that's not all they could achieve. It's pushing them a little bit forward, showing them that small successes count. So for example, a kid who is uh, making C's all the time, mm -hmm doesn't make sense for a parent or a teacher to say to them, oh, I see you're trying your best and maybe that's all you could do. No, you don't say that. You, you say, okay, let's look at what you're doing wrong. Let's figure out if you're missing any gaps in your education. Let's fill those gaps in and then push you forward. You know, and it's, it's about looking at where the gaps are. Um, developing, developing them, building a strong foundation, and then enriching the child so that if he or she is not at grade level, pushing them to grade level, and then pushing them forward. So it's ultimately about how much you care, almost. I think it's a very subjective uh, concept, but the amount of care you show kids will ultimately uh, increase their uh, achievement. So when you're saying support system and, and kind of changing mentality and how you speak or, or respond to someone, do you think that that is also something that could be applied to people who have dreams or things that they're trying to chase that they may also have in their mind a self-fulfilling prophecy and just need to be surrounded by the same kind of thing you were talking about earlier, support and positivity? Yes, I actually totally do believe that. I was just looking on my uh, on my um, list of quotes that I have. It says, um, "Nothing is impossible. The world itself says I'm possible." Meaning, 
Oh, you know, yeah. The word right? impossible when you, okay, if you break it up. Yeah, if you put the I apostrophe possible, I am possible. So I think huh. ultimately you can't, you can't say that, you know, just going back to my whole concept of self-fulfilling prophecy, you can't go back to that and think that things are impossible. You have to believe that for yourself, anything is possible. So, you know, that's that quote. Uh, nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I am possible or I'm possible. That's, that's okay. actually really cool. I don't think I ever realized that. Yeah. I, I actually found it um, maybe like two or three days ago. I love that quote. Because yeah, it's very it, powerful. It, it really makes you think, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like that um, the other saying, there's no I in team. It, it has yeah. its own like power in it. Yeah. And, and there's actually another uh, quote that I like too. It's do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Because the whole thing about chasing dreams, in my opinion, is uh, is once you do attain that dream, don't forget about the people that you pass by. Because ultimately, the greatest... Uh, and most successful people, in my, in my opinion, are the ones that are willing to pull others up as well and show them how to become successful. Well, that's a good point, because I, I think and I've heard it and I've experienced it. Um, you know, when you're able to teach someone what you understand, it's a great test of if you truly actually understand it. Right. You can memorize all the things you want, but can you actually show it to someone else? Right, exactly. So now that you have this, this, um, the tutoring, you're working on this, you know, in today's society, you were talking earlier about how things are different, how things have a different mentality. What do you think about that? How can we turn things around? Because I do believe that changing one's mindset uh, for education also impacts their mindset for what they believe they're capable of. Is there... Is there anything outside of support that can be done to help kind of change those around us in the next generation? Uh, that's that's a loaded question, Amy. It I'm is, a very like, powerful and loaded person. Well, I'll tell you this much. I think um, I think if you want to, I don't know the exact quote for this one, but you know, basically the concept is be the change you want. Uh, wa want, you know, you want be the change that you want to exist. So basically, if you if you want things to change, you have to model it yourself, right? If if you're always so limiting, if you're always limiting yourself, and people your the people around you could see it, then they're going to think, okay, well, if he's doing it, why can't I do it? So it's something to always model that you're always pushing forward. I mean, you know, even with me, right? I uh, I go daily and I try to visit businesses in the various areas where I work. And, and I just walk in and I introduce myself. I say, hey, my name is Judy Matthew. I'm with Tudor Doctor. I'm the new owner in this area. And I just wanted to introduce myself. And the thing is, let me tell you, doing those cold visits to businesses are not fun. But I know that in the long run, those small steps that I'm taking will lead to a brighter future. So if I was the type of owner that just sat on my butt and didn't do anything, that's, you know, that's something that I think would eventually translate over to my tutors. And my tutors would be like, well, this guy doesn't care. I'll just do whatever I can to help some kids here and there. But you know, even even though I've acquired this practice, one of the things that I've been trying my best to do is reach out and meet the tutors that were previously hired by the previous owner mm -hmm. so that I have a better idea of who they are. And I know I could recommend them as well for students and that I'm not just recommending the new guys that I bring on or new gals that I bring on. So it's very important to know your organization. It's very important to know yourself. It's very important to push yourself forward no matter what the situation. I mean, I get tired after my stroke walking for 10, 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, walking in the heat, all this stuff. I, I get tired, but I will 
push myself because I believe in the uh, end 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 goals that I have set for myself. And you know, before I told you, Amy, that I never got to finish my doctorate. One of my underlying goals for this business is to make the income necessary so that I could go back and finish my doctorate in education because I think I've worked too hard and too long to not have the earned the right to be called Dr. Matthew. That's awesome. I didn't know that. You didn't you didn't tell me that one. That's awesome. Well, since I had this joke, Hofstra University has given me uh, a few years to get that doctorate completed, and I know the professors there, and I give them a shout out. It's uh, Dr. Eustace Thompson and a former a professor who was there, Dr. Karen Osterman, and um, also uh, Monica Jimenez. They all were very instrumental in terms of uh, wanting me to come back eventually and finish my doctorate. So I really. I'm looking forward to that one day. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I have the goal to make it happen one day. That's all right. That's the first step. It takes takes time, but hey, you started it. That's awesome. Right. But I, I want to go back real quick to to something you said earlier about how you're you're tired after your day because you know, guys, she knew is awesome. I, I'm biased. I understand that, but you know, knowing what he's gone through, what he's doing currently, you're tired, but. You also work on yourself physically. Yep. Right. What what motivates you for that? You know, because you're in the gym, you're working, and I know you have your own uh, mindset for that. But how do you get yourself to go and just keep at it? I mean, you had some PRs recently. I thought personal records. Yes, I did have some personal records. I um. At pre-stroke, I used to lift a lot more. I used to bench a lot more. All those different kinds of things. And uh, after the stroke, there was one time actually I laid underneath the bench, uh, trying to just move the 45-pound bar, and I couldn't even grip it with my left hand. This was maybe about five, six years ago. And I, I'll be honest with you, Amy. I I laid there underneath on that bench mm -hmm. and I started crying because I I didn't know what to do. And you know what? I said to myself, okay, that's just a small setback. You know, I, I, maybe what I need to do is instead of going for that big goal or pushing all that weight, maybe I could start working on the small goals and working on the smaller muscle groups to help me attain that goal. So that's what I did. I broke up my workouts into things that are manageable. Maybe it's not the full-blown workout that I wanted to do, but over time I was able to, on a Smith machine, bench uh, three times, I was able to get 250 pounds up. On a squat machine, I was able to get up to um, almost 300 pounds squatting. So, you know, I have certain goals for myself and I work on small levels towards those goals. And that's exactly what I've been saying all this time. It's those small successes that matter. You know, being able to grip that weight and have a steady form was more important to me than pushing up a lot of weight. So I, I worked on each piece by piece and, you know, I celebrated each small success. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is they want certain, um, and I'm not going to lie and say that I don't want to be skinny overnight, but I do. <laughs> and, um, but, but I also know the reality of that is it takes time. It takes hard work. And, and eventually I'll get there. It's not going to be anything in a short period of time. So like the fad workouts and the fad diets, none of that stuff I know work. Uh, it's more about just, you know, going in regularly and motivating yourself. And my, my motivation is very different from other people's motivation. It's not just about losing the weight, but it's to get to 100%. My doctors told me at one point that I may not even get out of my wheelchair. So... I think I've done a pretty good job proving them wrong. So, you know, for me, I love proving people wrong if I could possibly do it. As, as you know, as a full-time job, yeah, you totally would. As you know very well, Amy, I can never prove my wife wrong, but that's your that, cousin. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, you probably won't ever win that one, buddy. But you know, guys, that's something that's been classic Janu, as we say, because even after his stroke, he set a date where he would get back to the church where he had served uh, in the altar and he met it. 
he met it after working hard and, and, you know, focusing on that. And that's classic Janu, uh, is what we say, but you guys can do that too, because put your mind to it. And the fact that, uh, he's an example of overcoming. And now I know about self-fulfilling prophecies. You guys got to avoid that. Say no to that kind of stuff. Cause it's not good for you. Not good for you. Now, Janu, in your experience, having been a teacher, an administrator, a tutor, what would you say is one of the, aside from self-fulfilling prophecies and, and what uh, students are hearing, what is another thing, I guess, would be better to say, another thing that students are faced with that they need to kind of, now on an audio platform, you would say, stop thinking that. I think um, when people come to a roadblock, a lot of times, especially in this day and age where we have all this technology out there, all these different things, when people tell me they can't go any further, I tell them, get on the internet and figure it out. Because there's plenty of stuff out there that are right at our fingertips that we can learn from. Like I, you know, when I, st when I started working on this business, I had to write a business plan. I had to learn how to do projections. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. But what did I do? I got on the internet. I YouTubed it. I researched it. And I figured it out. But you can't say to, say to someone, well, I don't know how to do that anymore. Because even if you don't know how to do that, there are plenty of resources to figure out how to learn it. So I just don't, I think when people say I can't, it should never be I can't anymore. I think those days are gone. It should be I will. I will figure it out. Not I can't do it. Because there's no such thing as I can't. Well, what if somebody said to you that no one else has done it before? Well, then that means that uh, you could be the first to do it and show everybody else. I mean, even no one else has done it before. Mm -hmm. There was a time when no one else has uh, flown to the moon or no one has lifted a lot of weight or no one has ran a mile for the first time in under six minutes or whatever it may be. But there is always at least one person that has to do it before you could use that statement. So be the first to do it. You know, be the first to go out and create a new invention or be the first to go out and change the political scheme of things in this country or be the first to go out and uh, make some kind of radical change or, you know, whatever it may be. There are so many different options out there that each kid could do that they, they need to experience, you know? And I would say experience the different opportunities that come your way. One of the things that I truly pride myself on is when I was in college, I tried to experience any, as many different things as I can. I got to be the guy who um, ran cables and wires for a NCAA game, which was, they were, they were called runners. And I would call the wires I got to work, and so I did that a few times, got paid absolutely nothing. And then one day, an NBC executive or producer that was at a Vanderbilt game, he asked me to work inside their truck, relaying information from NBC Studios, to from, from the Vanderbilt game to NBC Studios, making sure the score is right for wow. a basketball. So, I mean, I got to do so many different things, and it's only because I put myself out there. You know, I, 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 w I worked as a bouncer at one point in my life. I um, got to be part of a Latino fraternity. You know, I mean, I did so many different things that uh, a normal Indian kid wouldn't even try. You know, and I think all of that comes from my ability to just try different things. You know, of course, within limits and also being responsible, but ultimately try different things and see what outcomes there are. There was even a time when one of my Vanderbilt professors said, instead of going into education, I should become an executive coach. I mean, I didn't do that because my passion, my calling was education. So, you know, I think there was a lot of different things that I've gotten to do and it's just, it's just a lot of fun, you know? So, I mean, I even write in my spare time once in a while. I, I've been working on a, a children's book series that, one day I hope to produce, maybe on Amazon, but again, that's something that will come later on in the road. I want to first become successful in this business before focusing my attention to other things as well. 
which is an awesome thing to to do. At least you're you're always thinking ahead. You just you have that kind of thing in you. Um, so before we wrap up, Janu, and I gave you a, a small heads up, so hopefully you have an answer. What is one action you would recommend to someone who's chasing their dream today? What is one thing that they should do today? So there was something that I learned when I was working with New York Life. Um, I, I did the life insurance sales for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Didn't enjoy it. It was not my cup of tea. But um, there was this thing that always stuck with me, and it was called analysis paralysis. And basically the concept there is if you have a lot of goals in life and you're always analyzing how to get there for each and every single goal and you never prioritize your goals, then you'll be stuck in analysis paralysis, which means that you're overanalyzing things and you're never going to get out of that rut and you will never achieve any of your goals. So one of the first things I would say is in terms of chasing your dreams is prioritize what you think are achievable, what are short term goals, what are long term goals what are mid-range goals and organize it in that order and then go from there and then make small, um, you know, benchmarks of what you could attain and then try to hit those benchmarks. And if you hit one benchmark, don't say, okay, I haven't done. You set another benchmark that's a little bit better. And I'll give you a very simple example for that. I had a student that I was tutoring here in Texas. She was a second or third grader. Mm -hmm. uh, her school was not really pushing them to learn their multiplication tables. They just wanted to, them to learn the concepts of it, which is very similar to Common Core, which, by the way, I do like Common Core. But, you know, it's ultimately um, I do believe that there has to be some memorization of mathematical concepts. So anyway, I started working with her. She could not memorize her multiplication tables. It was very difficult. And once we got to a point where she could, I started giving her problem sets using a um, I, iPhone app, which tested her speed. So she was able to get 30 problems in um, two minutes. Then we said, OK, she said, OK, well, look, I got 100 on it, you know, four or five times. I'm done. I said, no, 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 no. You did 30 problems in two minutes. Let's do 30 problems in a minute 30. OK, oh, you new, upped it. Then let, let's do uh, 30 problems in a minute. And then eventually we actually got down to the point where it was 30 problems in 27 seconds. And she did great. And, and if I had stopped at that two minute mark and said, that's all you could do, she would have been stuck there. But instead we made small goals and we kept practicing and practicing and practicing. And those things led to a phenomenal thing. She's super proud of. She knows she could do the math. She knows she could think quick on her feet, especially in mathematics. And she is doing phenomenal right now. And, you know, definitely one of my favorite success stories because it was a kid who kept saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. And even sometimes, you know, her parents would say, oh, maybe that's the most she could do. But, you know, those small benchmarks and those small steps have led to a wonderful, wonderful thing. And at such an early age to, to, write the course, so to speak, of, of her believing that her, her limit was so low. And, you know, there are a lot of kids out there. I don't think it's because I don't think they're, um, you know, unable to do things. I just think they're not pushed enough. Well, I know you're going to keep pushing them, especially through Tutor Doctor, and you are going to do amazing things. I can't wait to see it. Jim, thank you for taking the time this evening to jump on the show and share your story and some great advice. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. It was fun. And guys, that was my cousin, Janu Matthew, who is amazing. He has been through so much and come out on top, and he continues to challenge himself and those around him and those who he tutors, as you know. So first as a teacher, then an administrator, and now as a franchise owner of Tutor Doctor, he rocks, and he will continue to help mold the minds of young people in Texas as well as around the country, And because I'm sure somebody will come across him and he'll help someone. And they will help someone, and it's just a ripple effect that will continue to grow, grow, grow. And you guys can learn more about what he is doing, about uh, the things he's talked about today. All links are going to be in the show notes that you can find over at 
ChasingDreamsHQ.com slash episode 78. That's episode 78. And I just want to emphasize, do not fall victim to self-fulfilling prophecies. You guys are better than that. You can achieve anything you set your mind to. So don't set it low and don't think that whatever you set it to is all you can reach. Because just like Junior said, slowly, slowly, if you kind of chip at it and move your way up, you'll find and be surprised at what you can do. So keep that in mind. Okay. So until next time, guys, keep chasing. Thank you so much for listening to Chasing Dreams. Amy would love to connect with you and hear all about your pursuit of chasing your dreams. Connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram via at Chasing Dreams HQ. Or you can find Amy on Twitter at AmyJ21. That's aimeej two one. Be sure to visit headquarters over at ChasingDreamsHQ.com for more inspiration, motivation, and resources to help with your own dream chase. We hope you'll join Amy next week. And until then, keep chasing.